Good morning. Welcome to Christ Community Church. We're so glad that you've joined us in this digital sanctuary today. What a week it's been. We've watched the COVID cases continue to rise. Quite often this week, daily death toll approached 4,000. And our eyes have been fixed on the events in our nation's capital. The strife, the turmoil, the chaos, the violence. Life is hard. And even though we're in a new year, it seems like we are continuing to face the same problems. You know, this week I've been thinking about some words in John's Gospel, John chapter 6. And Jesus had just given his disciples a very, very difficult teaching. And many, many people moved away from Jesus. They left him. They deserted him. And Jesus turned to the disciples and said, will you too leave me? And Peter, Peter stepped up and he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of life. And as I think about the world in which we live, the trouble that we face, there's no one but our God and Savior that we can turn to. For you, God, alone have the words of life. Would you say that with me? You, Lord, alone have the words of life. This morning, we're going to turn our eyes toward the God who has the words of life and wants to speak them into our lives individually and communally as a church, as a nation, as a world. I encourage you to take out your PDF, posture yourself in a way that you can bring as much as yourself as you can to God. You might want to stand with me today as we sing. And we're going to begin by singing this song, Great Are You, Lord. You give life. You are love. You bring light to our darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. life you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great
All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great. Shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. So great are you, Lord. You know, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 10, he talks about the ways of the world and the ways of the kingdom. And he said they're in constant conflict. And the Apostle Paul tells us that the weapons that God gives us are very different than the weapons of flesh and blood. The weapons, the, the God tools, I love how Eugene Peterson translates this. He says, the God tools that we have can take down every argument that stands against the way of Christ. And one of those powerful God tools that we have at our disposal is praise. It's one of the things that we do when we worship, we're pulling out that God tool and we're renewing our mind. We're, we're breathing in the goodness of God and breathing out his praise and our minds and our hearts are being filled with the things of God. Let's use that tool as we bring our praise to God. that silences the enemy. The praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and claim your victory. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Faith be the song that overcomes the raging sea. Let faith be the song that calms the storms inside of me. Let it rise. Let faith arise. We'll see you break down. 
down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Watch the giants fall, for few cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall, for few cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, 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 we praise you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today we are launching a new pilgrimage practice. This is a regular rhythm for us at Christ Community where we choose a spiritual discipline and we practice it together, both individually and communally. And these help us on our journey with God to find God together. They help us connect with God, one another, and our world. And David Wadsworth has been worshiping with us for the last few months. And this morning he is here with me to tell us about our new discipline, which is practicing the present moment. So David, thanks so much for being with us this morning. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so you've been practicing this discipline quite a lot over the last few years. So tell us a little bit about your experience. Okay, first I'll say that um, like most of us, uh, I have a pace of life where uh, I'm more comfortable staying in motion, mm -hmm. like and having noise around me and distractions happening pretty much throughout the day. Mm -hmm. What uh, I've come to realize is that this uh, is almost a form of avoidance for me because the challenges of life and the stressors are still hitting me, but I've never, uh, with that pace, I'm, uh, I'm just not taking the time to recognize how I'm feeling Mm -hmm. and that these are real, so essentially there are real needs that are going unrecognized and unmet. Mm -hmm. And as they become overwhelming, then I would seek these ways of just looking for comfort and escape, just not knowing what to do. And uh, I would look for comfort and escape in anything but God. Mm -hmm. And so this discipline has helped me to recognize that and, res and have new ways of responding. Okay, good. So tell us about it. Like what, how does this discipline work and how does it help you to connect with God? Yeah, so essentially it's about just being in a quiet place mm -hmm. and uh, checking in with my body, with my emotions, with the things around me. Um, it's really important as well that uh, I notice the presence of God in the midst mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. So I have to be willing, first of all, to recognize like uncomfortable emotions mm -hmm. and then allow God in that same place with me mm -hmm. and just notice like how he's showing up in that mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. um, and then as well, I try to consider or I'm learning to consider. So based on what I'm feeling, like what is needed? And that might be uh, a conversation with a friend or it could be reassurance, but uh, actually having the willingness then to take action based on, okay, here's what I've recognized, here's what's needed. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm gonna do something different from what I've done in the past, mm -hmm. like in order to meet that need. Mm 
and also just realizing like how God is able to meet that need. Just his presence can be so healing. Mm, yeah. So this practice seems like it's really helping you to center, be aware of what's happening, what's present for you right now in this moment and to meet God in that space. Um, how has that helped you to connect with God and other people? Uh, so it's helped me a lot uh, <laughs> in terms of my relationship with other people. Mm -hmm. Um as I share myself, I'll share like the things that I would in the past just hide and avoid. But as mm. I'm becoming, just allowing myself to be seen and known by the people mm. who care about me and mm. experiencing what their acceptance mm -hmm. is, has been really healing. Mm. Um, it's also deep in relationships in that it, like I've learned how to make the capacity or have the capacity to make room for what they're going through yeah. and be a better listener. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, in terms of my relationship with God, it's really been about just um, as I notice his presence in the hardest places, the painful places and the good places, mm -hmm. it really helped me understand his heart toward me mm -hmm. and replace like a few of the lies that I've been living under. So, I mean, a big one is replacing the lie that I have to measure up somehow mm -hmm. with the truth of his love, his compassion, mm -hmm. and just having experiences with him that are unlike anything I'd had in the past because mm -hmm. of uh, this practice. Wow, well, that's quite a recommendation for it. So um, if mm -hmm. other people wanna try it and they wanna um, give it a go for the first time, what tips would you have for them? Uh, I would say to be patient with yourself, um, mm -hmm. that uh, it will take time. Mm -hmm. It's uncomfortable at first, um, but there is something happening mm -hmm. in the midst of it. And, um, and I also say it won't always be like an aha moment. Mm -hmm. that really, it's about noticing and accepting like what is mm -hmm. and, and that the growth and change will come out uh, of that. Yeah. And just being weight, having the ability like then to connect mm -hmm. um, is huge. Okay, great. Well, we're going to practice together right now. So there'll be more tips in the Monday update. You can check that every week. But for right now, let's uh, take some time and practice the present moment together. So thanks so much, David, for sharing your experience with us. Okay, thank you. So yeah, thanks again, David, for being willing to share how this practice has helped shape your experience with God and your relationship with other people. It's really important and it's something that we don't often think about to do. Um, I've been thinking about it a lot over the last few weeks and recognizing that for the last little while, it's been more challenging for me to be present in Zoom meetings, even during worship with all these other distractions around me. And so I've been trying to practice this myself. Um, and let me say that when I rewatched the video that we shared this weekend um, about preparing ourselves and our space for worship that Amber and I made way back in like May, um, I was pretty convicted too, because it can be, um, I'm not doing any of those things anymore. And so it can be really hard to be present with God and other people during worship when I'm still surrounded by all my work files from Friday and all the stuff that I have set out to do tomorrow and next week. And those two things just pull my attention away from this present moment. And so this morning I cleared all of that away and made my space different for worship. And it really helped, it made a big difference. I'm feeling a lot more present and engaged this morning. So we're gonna practice being present together right now. And kids, if you've been dancing around or off playing with your toys, come back and join us because you can do this too. This is a really good practice for all ages. So come on back and let's begin by putting aside all of our distractions. So if you have your cell phone out, you're scrolling Twitter while we're here, or if you're still finishing your breakfast, let's just put our phones in our pockets and put everything else aside and try to come into this present moment. So now that we have all of those distractions away, let's notice that the present moment is actually the only time that we can actually meet with God because we don't live in the past. And no matter how hard we try to push ourselves into the next season, we can't actually move forward there. We are here right now. 
And God is present with us in this moment. So everybody sit comfortably, whether you're in your chair or kids, if you're sitting on the floor, try to relax and become still. Let's all take a deep breath together in through our noses and out through our mouths. Be present in this moment. Keep breathing slowly and start to notice any sounds that you hear in your space. Pay attention to any smells that you might smell. Notice the texture of something near you. Maybe touch your sweater or a soft blanket or the smoothness of your coffee cup. Noticing our physical surroundings can help to root us in this present moment. And now draw your attention to your body. What are you feeling right now? Can you feel your feet on the floor, the weight of your body against the chair? Can you identify any emotions that you're feeling right now? What do they feel like in your body? What does that emotion need? Now try to focus on God's presence with you in the room right now. You might imagine Jesus coming to sit near you. Focus on the expression on his face. God offers you love, mercy, grace, forgiveness right now. You can rest with God in this present moment. Breathe. I'll invite you to open your eyes and come back to this communal space. This is a discipline that you can practice at any time to reconnect with God and with your own soul. And the more you practice it, the more you'll be able to access that calm and that awareness of the present moment and God's presence with you in it, even in the swirl of your regular life. There'll be tips every week in the Monday update, and I encourage you to practice this discipline with us together in these next two months. So I wanted to mention that if you didn't see the video that I mentioned a few minutes ago that Amber and I did back in the spring, um, go back and watch that. It's, it's really helpful to think about fresh ways to prepare yourself and your space for worship each Sunday morning. Uh, it's on our Facebook and our Vimeo pages. And uh, we asked on our Facebook page, what's one thing that you could do to prepare yourself to make this morning set apart? And so if you watch that video and you did something, we'd love to hear what that is. So feel free to write that in the chat now, or you can go comment on our Facebook page later. But let's help each other and up our engagement in this new year, how we can be more present and engaged during worship. So this morning, we're starting a new series on Psalm 23. And we'll be dwelling in this familiar psalm until we begin the season of Lent. And on Thursdays at noon, Terry's going to be hosting a practicing together session every week that help us engage that psalm in different ways. And so we hope you can take a few minutes in the middle of your day and join us for that practice. If that time doesn't work for you, remember you can always watch it later at a time that does work for you. It'll be on the page after we're done. Uh, my second announcement is that in just a few weeks, we're going to be returning to our anti-racism work. And I wanted to let you know now so you can get a copy of the book in time to begin. So we're going to be reading Esau McCulley's book called Reading While Black. And I just finished it about two weeks ago, and it is an excellent read. And in it, McCulley is talking about the way that our experiences shape the way we approach God and the Bible. And as a black man, he offered me a new perspective on scripture than I had as a white woman. And I would really encourage you to join us for reading this book. Um, we'll be reading it during Black History Month, and I hope that you can join us for that on Tuesday nights. And again, that book is called Reading While Black by Esau McCulley, and there'll be a link to it tomorrow in the Monday update. 
So our last announcement is that our Younger Faith High group will be meeting this morning at 1130 on Zoom with Brad Kraft. And you should have received information about that from Amber, but if you have any questions or you need her to send it again, you can reach out to her and she will help you get connected. So now let us transition to our time of offering. Let's bring our gifts back to God with prayer. And as a reminder, you can give online via text or through the mail. And all the information for those things is in this morning's worship guide. And so I'll have you pull that out again right now and join me as we offer our gifts together in prayer. So let's pray. Father, all that we have is yours. Make us faithful stewards of your blessings. We offer these gifts back to you with love and gratitude. Train the hearts of all your children toward generosity, that the world might know that our Father is generous. Use these gifts and those who give them for the building of your kingdom and the glory of your name. Let us love you well in our giving, even as you have loved us by giving us all things in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for continuing to give to what God is doing in us and with us and through us in the South Hills. So now it is time to greet each other. So please leave your mics muted, but turn on your camera and wave to everybody. And if you don't normally turn your camera on, why not take a risk this morning and let us see your face? It's really good to see who is present with us in this space every week. So scroll through and say hi. Wow, it's been a fun morning, technically. I have no idea how things are going on your end, but uh, I cleared out my space like Catherine uh, has suggested and uh, having all sorts of technical issues here this morning. But thanks for hanging in there. Thanks for being, being with us here on this uh, Sunday morning in this digital space. So we're beginning this, this new series and uh, we're calling it Sheepish, Sheepish. Now, as, as you hear that word, what comes to mind? Or maybe just simply, do you have positive feelings about that word or negative feelings about that word? Positive connotations or negative? Is it an adjective that you would like to be attached to your character, your nature? So uh, sheepish in the dictionary, uh, here you go. Uh, the definition of sheepish, resembling a sheep. Well, okay, got that. But such as meek or timid, 
or stupid. Hmm. Affected by or showing embarrassment caused by consciousness of a fault, as in a sheepish grin. Whew. Doesn't sound like a very positive kind of attribute. And yet, in this series, my hope and my goal is that we could reframe how we understand this word sheepish. I want us to, to take a biblical approach and allow our mind and our heart and our lives to be captivated by the truth of God. Because ultimately, I believe that God has called each of us individually and all of us communally to be sheepish in our character, in our attitudes, in our actions and behaviors. I want to talk for a moment uh, about the Old Testament. And there are lots of different images for God in the Old Testament. And before we get to this sheepish image, I, I want to bring these words from Psalm 118 before you this morning. I love you, Lord, my strength. This is a Psalm of David. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. Now, I'd like you to, to look at those words on the screen for a moment and see if you see any themes. Is there a thread that's woven through these three verses that come to us from uh, the pen of David? I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. Look at the images that David brings to the people of God through this poetry, through this prayer, through his own relationship with God. He says, Lord, I love you for you are my, my strength. Lord, you are my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. You're the one in whom I take refuge. You're my shield. You're my horn. You're my strength of my salvation. And you're my stronghold. And you are the one who saves me from my enemies. Rock, fortress, deliverer, strength, shield, refuge, horn of salvation, salvation from enemies. I, I love what Kenneth, Kenneth Bailey, a great biblical scholar who, who really uh, spent much of his life living in uh, the Middle East and, and in Israel and embedding himself in the Hebraic culture, that Middle Eastern Palestinian culture. He says, the images that we find here for God from David, and we find these throughout the Old Testament, are those of homeland security. God is our protector, strength, rock, fortress, deliverer, shield, refuge. And these are really important attributes to be aware of, that this is who God is. But Bailey also cautions that if this is the only way we see God, and if we lean too heavily on these kinds of images, we're going to miss another dimension of God's nature and character. And in the Psalms, we also find what Bailey calls a minority report. Let me talk about these for a moment. One, God is like a father. Psalm 103, 13 says this. As a father has compassion on his children, 
so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. It's a little different image than we just read in Psalm 18. Another image, God is like a mother, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I'm like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. The psalmist here is comparing himself to a child who is contented with his mother, like a weaned child. God is like a mother, again, very different than the homeland security images that we find in Psalm 18. And then lastly, God is like a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. As I said, these are minority pictures of God in the Old Testament. But they become primary images and metaphors for what God is like in the New Testament. Think about this for a moment. God is like a father. God is like a mother. God is like a shepherd. Sometime this week, I encourage you to go to Luke 15, where Jesus tells three incredible parables about the kingdom of heaven. Tells us what the kingdom is like. Tells us what God is like. Tells a story about a woman who loses a coin. A shepherd who loses a sheep. And a father who loses his children, both his younger and older son. You see, Jesus... And, and the writers of the New Testament push us into very different images of God, relational, compassionate, yet strong. Images that we can put confidence in because God is like a father. God is like a mother. And God is like a shepherd. So this is an image that I'd like us to come to uh, with regularity over the next few weeks as we delve into this series. It's not the greatest piece of art, but it is an ancient piece of art. This is artwork that was found in a catacomb. It's probably third century, 1700 years old. And this is a, an image that was found on the wall of an early catacomb. Now, one of the things that they discovered through archeological research is that there were three primary images that the early church used in these catacombs to kind of symbolize who they were as people, who they were as a community of faith. Some of these are, are two of these are, are, are pretty obvious. One is, is a vine. I am the vine, you are the branches from John 15. Another one, they found many, many images of the fish, the ichthus, that was a symbol and a sign that we are God's people, and they were, that was used to communicate, uh, you know, fellowship and, and who was in the community of faith. But the overwhelming image that was found in these catacombs, in these caves, in these places where God's people would gather, is the image of the good shepherd, and this is one of them. God to the early people, the early followers of, of Jesus, the earliest Christian community, they set their eyes on the Lord who was their good shepherd. Yes, God was refuge, God was strength, God was present help in times of trouble, but the, the overwhelming image that the early church banked on and trusted in was the good shepherd. We're going to take a little more time at the end of this talk to, to focus in on this image. But, but I want to remind you that the Good Shepherd was foundational in the life of the early church. And church historians say that something kind of happened, fourth century-ish, that the church moved away from this image of the Good Shepherd and began to embrace other images, metaphors, illustrations, of who God is, maybe it's time to return to seeing our God 
as the good shepherd. And that's why we're going to spend six or seven weeks as we begin 2021 in this series called Sheepish. Life Lessons from Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is probably one of the most beloved texts in scripture. But my suspicion is if you took a hundred people and said, what's your favorite text of scripture? Many of them would say Psalm 23. One of the things that I've noticed in 30 some years of pastoral work is even though we're living more and more in a post-Christian age, Psalm 23 still seems to, to resonate with people. Unfortunately, I think many people attach Psalm 23, they, they call it the funeral, the funeral scripture. It's the, it's the scripture that you read at funerals. And I, it's a very appropriate thing to read at the funeral of a beloved child of God. But it's so much more, so much more. And there are rich, deep life lessons that we can draw from from this ancient poem that comes to us from the hand of David, both king and shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. One of the things that I'm going to encourage you to do over the next six weeks is to memorize Psalm 23. Some of you maybe already have it tucked into your heart, in your head, in your soul. And if you do, great. You might want to even maybe memorize it in another translation. There are so many beautiful translations out there of this, this ancient poem and prayer. But I'd like us to all commit to taking these words to heart so that we can actually meditate on them. We can chew on them. We can allow them to impact our mind and our words and our behaviors and our attitudes so that God's word is at work from the inside out. Yeah, I've, been, I've been meditating on this Psalm in the morning and at noontime and before I close my eyes at night for the past weeks, just allowing the beauty, the power, of these words to do whatever God wants them to do in my life. And I encourage you to do that as well. Make a commitment to memorize God's word. That's for all of us, not just children, children of all ages to, to take in scripture and allow it to penetrate our deepest being. This morning for just a few moments, we wanna talk about this first verse. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What does it mean to call upon the Lord as shepherd? Ken, let me reference a little bit of Ken Bailey's work. The Lord is my shepherd, he says, among other things, it means I have no police protection. In those open trackless spaces. The traveler and his companions are alone. Thieves, wild animals, snakes, sudden blinding dust storms, water shortages, loose rocks, furnace-like heat are all potential threats to any traveler. All of this was affirmed in the 12th century in the Armenian Orthodox tradition through the commentary on the Psalms composed by Archbishop Nurses of Lamben in Armenia. Listen to these words from the 12th century. The Lord is my shepherd. In other words, I wandered in the midst of beasts, dogs, and bulls that surrounded me. Lions opened their mouths and wished to ravish me. I was terrified. And because of fear, I made a treaty with the Savior. Therefore, do not be afraid, O oh my soul, for he is my shepherd, and I shall not want. 
we live in a dangerous world. We live in a world where many of us, many of us are, are captivated by fear. Fear is an, an animating force. And the church through the ages have, has latched on to this beginning of the psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. He will care for me through every trial, through every test, through every danger and snare, whatever it might be. Most of us aren't surrounded by beasts and dogs and bulls and lions who wish to ravish us, but there are forces out there that are frightening. And the psalmist helps us to put our trust in the shepherd who is right there with us every step of the way. And David reminds us that if God is our shepherd, we shall not want. The psalmist, David, David recognizes in his life that there are a very basic set of wants and needs. And the shepherd provides for his sheep. Think again from a sheepish standpoint. David reminds us that the good shepherd cares for the needs of the sheep. Food, drink, tranquility, rescue when lost, freedom from the fear of evil and death, a sense of being surrounded by the grace of the Lord and a permanent dwelling place in the house of God. An ever-increasing mountain of material possessions is not on the list. There's no hint for any need for power or control. An externally generated set of compulsive desires and the need to be constantly entertained are also absent. The sheep knows that only with the shepherd's help can they secure the limited list of basic needs. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. What does that reveal about a sheepish character? How might the understanding that comes with that affirmation, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, how might that inform us to be sheepish kind of people. I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that have happened in our world this week. This week has been a hard week, a challenging week, a lamentable week, a week that has, has rocked us as a nation. It's rocked our world. It's rocked us individually and communally. What does it mean to be sheepish in the midst of what we've seen over these past days? I think the psalm gives us some clue. How many of you have been to the Capitol? I have. It's quite a place. It's quite a structure. The architecture is stunning. And it is symbolic of our democracy. And yet, and yet we, we saw in a sense desecrated. I think I find it so fascinating that our capital has this distinctive dome. Where do you typically see domes? Maybe you've been to Florence and, and the, the Duomo or St. Peter's massive dome or St. Paul's in London. And they're typically found in, in, in religious structures. And the founders of our country, you know, put this dome on, not the founders of our country, but later they, they, they put this dome on our, our, our national capital as a symbolic architectural move to remind us that what happens in this space is significant. And in a sense, it was, it was desecrated. 
an assortment of white supremacist groups, ultra conservative activists, other followers of President Trump gathered for what I think, and I would call an anti-democratic rally, a protest and a riot. It's filled with incendiary rhetoric, hate speech. We saw images of gallows and nooses, threats to execute our vice president and other elected officials. It's violent, murderous, and death dealing. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. This all happened on Wednesday, January 6th. It was Epiphany. One of the three feast days in the Christian church, Christmas, Easter, and Epiphany, a high holy day, a day that's significant. And to me, one of the most grievous things that I witnessed was the co-opting Christianity and some of the things that unfolded before our eyes. These are staggering images. Tish Harrison Warren is an Anglican priest who's, who's based here in Pittsburgh. And she wrote a, a powerful essay in Christianity Today this week. And she connected the events that happened in Washington with Epiphany. She said, the season of epiphany reminds us that we do not just receive the light of Christ, we are charged with sharing it with the world. But if the nations are watching as people destabilize democracy while carrying flags that read, make America godly again, would any onlooker want anything to do with this Christ? The violence wrought by Trump supporters storming the Capitol yesterday is anti-epiphany. It's dark, it's based in untruth, the symbols of faith, Jesus' name, the cross, and the message have been co-opted to serve their cultish end. Let me just say this, Jesus, Jesus is never the author of chaos, confusion, threat, harm, violence, or death. Never. Never. One of the themes that we saw here in Washington, D.C., is this rise of, of Christian nationalism. There's a powerful study that was done at Baylor University, and these, these two professors have, have done extensive work around the nature of Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism is something we need to pay attention to as people of God, as followers of Jesus living in the United States. Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry in their book, Taking America Back for God, say Christian nationalism is a cultural framework that identifies and advocates a fusion of Christianity with American civic life. Christian nationalism contends that America has been and should always be distinctly Christian from top to bottom in its self-identity, its interpretations of its own history, sacred symbols, its cherished values, and public policy that aims to keep it that way. But Christian and Christian nationalism is more about identity than religion, and it carries with it assumptions about nativism, white supremacy, authoritarianism, patriarchy, and militarism. If you look at some of the, the pillars of Christian nationalism, you will see that they do not comport with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In no way, shape, or form. They do not. Darrell Ford, who's a pastor in Atlanta, he pastors the Icon Community Church. He said this, Christian nationalism is a perversion of the gospel. Anytime a nation takes on the identity of a savior in any way, it's nationalism. Anytime a nation is the primary mechanism for saving human history, we are guilty of nationalism. It's idolatry. 
And that is one of the fundamental sins that God warns his people about. What we saw in our nation's capital was anti-epiphany. And as Tish Harrison Warren says, this anti-epiphany reveals the horrid outgrowths of Christian nationalism, faulty spiritual formation, false teaching, political idolatry, and overriding ignorance. And she writes, though it saddens me deeply, it must be admitted, the atrocity was in part brought to us by the white evangelical church in America, an emaciated and malformed evangelical Political theology got us where we are. It's been a hard, hard week. And I think the invitation is to become sheepish. Oh, it's easy to target some of the incredibly destructive things and foolish things and evil things that we saw in Washington, D.C., but, but I know this has been convicting because far too often I trust in power. I want power. I want the refuge, the rock, the strength. I far too often trust in chariots and horses rather than trusting in the shepherd. And my hope and my prayer for each of us and all of us as a community of faith that we will redefine what it means to be sheepish. And here it is. This is my working definition. Sheepish. A deep abiding trust in the provision, protection, and presence of the Savior. Sheepish a deep abiding trust in the provision, protection, and presence of the Savior who is the good shepherd. Let me bring you back in closing to this image from the catacombs. What do you see in this image? And where do you find yourself in this image? There's so many things happening in this space. Look at the five different sheep and their different postures and places in the picture. Some have their eyes intently focused on the shepherd. Some are grazing. Their eyes are not on the shepherd. Maybe they're so confident and they trust the shepherd that they don't have to watch him. They trust that the shepherd has led them to green pastures. There's a sheep on the shepherd's shoulders. Maybe wounded, maybe injured, maybe prone to wandering. If you look closely in the upper left-hand corner, you will see a lion, a raging lion. What do you see in this image? And what kind of sheep are you? Do you identify with any of these sheep? Do you identify with anything that's unfolding in this piece of art? Is there an invitation to a deeper abiding trust in the provision, protection, and presence of the Savior who is the good shepherd? That's my hope. And that's my prayer, that we would become sheepish people. And we will learn what it means to trust our Good Shepherd. I'm going to invite you as we close today to pray these words. 
They're from Dallard, Dallas Willard, A Beautiful Book, A Life Without Lack. It's a commentary and meditation on Psalm 23. And as we close this morning, I invite you to pray these words with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we are so thankful to you that you have said, fear not little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We are thankful for the ease with which you walked upon this earth, the generosity and kindness you showed to people, the devotion with which you cared for those who were out of the way and in trouble, the extent to which you even loved your enemies and laid down your life for them. We are so thankful to believe that this is a life for us, a life without lack, a life of sufficiency. It's so clear in you, the sufficiency of your Father and the fullness of life that was poured through you. And we're so thankful that you have promised that same love, that same life, that same joy, that same power for us. Lord, slip up on us today. Get past our defenses, our worries, our concerns, and gently open our souls and speak your word into them. We believe you want to do it, and we wait for you to do it now. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm really glad that you've been a part of our gathering. And I encourage you, live into Psalm 23. Memorize it. Meditate on it. Take it to heart. And let's be the sheep of God's flock, the people who call upon the good shepherd. And as we go, let's pray these words of courage. Oh God, we bear witness to our faith that we are called to live lives of courage, love, and reconciliation in the ordinary and extraordinary moments of this day. Oh God, we bear witness too to our failures and complicities in the fractures of this world. May we be courageous today. May we learn today. And may we love today. Amen. Encourage you to hang around for a little bit. Connect with somebody in a breakout room. Peace be with you. Amen.